This, you can see this? Yep. Cool. Yes, I think we can start. Our second speaker is Ben McKenna, who will tell us about random determinants beyond invariance. Ben, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gina. I want to thank the organizers uh, for the invitation. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to talk to you. I'm giving the, essentially the second um, half of Gerard's talk, the second part of the story, uh, which is really the random matrix size. I'm talking really about the determinant problem he was discussing. Um, and this is based on two works. Uh, the first is this, this determinants paper with Gerard and Paul, and then at the end I'll talk about a solo paper on spin glasses. Um, so I'll remind you kind of this, the setting that Gerard was discussing, which is you're interested in some random functions fn going from rn to r, uh, and you want to understand the topological complexity, which is just counting critical points. Right? So you want to understand the sort of exponential behavior here um, of the expected number of critical points, and typically we're interested in the case when fn has few distributional symmetries, so we call this non-invariant. Right? So the, the elastic manifold um, was the main example we discussed, but there's also this anisotropic spin glasses that he mentioned. Um, and as he explained, the main tool, or the, th the first thing you do is cat's rice. And cat's rice transforms this into a question about random matrices. Um, and specifically, because you want to put a one over n log here, the limit that matters uh, on the cat's rice side is this problem. So I take hn to be an n by n real symmetric random matrix. Um, and I'm interested in the determinant and this absolute value, which is very important. I take expectation, and then I am interested in the sort of leading order exponential behavior. Okay, so this is primarily a talk um, about this problem, when, when HN is a random matrix typically with few distributional symmetries. Right? So we're calling this non-invariant here. Um, because there's distributional symmetry, few distributional symmetries here, there's also a few on this side. Uh, and so this is the talk is mostly about how do you do this, and what kind of generality can you do this problem. Um, and then at the, the, the last a few moments, I'll talk just about spin glasses um, and a, a, a certain spin glass problem, uh, a certain non invariant spin glass problem that you can handle with these kinds of techniques. Um, so, the plan for the talk is I'm going to talk about uh, Wigner matrices first to give sort of set one model uh, and give a general theorem, a general sort of concentration theorem in the style of telegrams with sort of telegrams uh, chronic measure concentration results. Um, in the second part, I'm going to apply this general theorem to, to certain other classical models, so sample covariance matrices, Erdos-Renyi matrices, band matrices. Um, the third part is, is if you know more about your matrices, if you have something like log Sobolev in the Gaussian case, for example, um, what can you do? And it's, it's there's sort of easier results uh, that go via something called the matrix Dyson equation, which Gerard mentioned and which I'll explain in more detail. Uh, and in the end, I'll talk about bipartite spin glasses, which is the um, the non-invariant model that you can understand once we sort of build up all this machinery. Okay, so the first part is about bigger matrices and the sort of general theorem. Um, and I want to start talking first just about the, the kind of history of random determinants. Okay, so there's, uh, right, we're interested in the determinants of random matrices, uh, and we're obviously not the first people to be interested in this. And so there's at least um, four strands that we're going to pull out of, of things that people have studied, questions that people have asked before. Um, so the first kind of question you can ask, or the first one that was asked historically, uh, is kind of, kind of exact formulas for small moments. So let's say you know HN maybe has um, ID entries, and I, I'm interested in the expected square of the determinant. Uh, so then you can just expand the determinant as a sum over permutations, and it's essentially combinatorics. So you kind of do combinatorics, um, and you can get exact formulas at finite n. So this goes back to at least the, the Forte in the 50s, and sort of earlier, even before uh, Wigner in 55. Um, for Sykes and Tookie in 52, uh, Nyquist, Rice, Rodin, actually this is the Rice's and Katz Rice, um, Prekopat in 67, actually Amir Dembo worked on this in 89, which he was kind of transitioning into probability. Um, the second question you can ask is, is Gaussian fluctuations. Right? So the determinant is a random variable, so you're, this is essentially asking a CLT question. Right? You can study the fluctuations of this random variable, um, which date back to Goodman in the 60s, uh, Delaney and the Cayer in 2000. 
Um, and then those are sort of the Gaussian models, these two, and then there's kind of invariance or uh, universality, I'm sorry, universality results, um, starting with Tao and Vu in 2012, Nguyen and Vu, uh, Bao Pan and Zhao in 15, and then in, in recent years, um, Paul Bergad, Krishna Modi, and Michel Pan have been working on these kinds of questions. Um, the third sort of strand we're pulling out is, is the studying the singularity probability. Right? So if I have a Bernoulli matrix, then the probability that the matrix is singular uh, is just the same as the probability of the determinant is zero. Right? And that's sort of a, a fruitful way of thinking about it. Um, and so it's kind of a nice arc here where Kumlos in 67 showed that for Bernoulli, this probability is a little O of one, um, but the truth should be exponential. And so kind of the first exponential bound was, was uh, Khan, Kumlos, and Samaretti in 95, and you got better and better bounds through uh, Tao and Vu and uh, Borgen, Vu and, and Wood. Uh, and then last year, uh, Konstantin Tikomirov sort of closed that uh, one strand with giving sort of the right exponential behavior. Um, and the last strand uh, that we pull out is essentially the same question that we ask. Okay, so we're we're sort of in this in this regime. Um, and, and the motivation for this question before was always landscape complexity. Right? So, so every, uh, all the results Gerard mentioned can essentially be rephrased as, as proving some kind of asymptotic of this type for a specific matrix HN which is the one that Katz Rice gives you for the specific uh, random function you're interested in. So typically the, the functions before, um, in many cases have this kind of invariance, this isotropy that Gerard is mentioning, uh, and that corresponds to some kind of invariance in the matrix HN. Um, but we're sort of, we, we can, uh, the citations in Gerard sort of transfer over here. So I wanna talk about, about Wigner matrices to begin with. So just to sort of set notation. Uh, so HN is, is a Wigner matrix, which means that the entries are ID up to symmetry. Um, and they're distributed according to some mu. So I pick a mu once and for all, like a Gaussian measure or Bernoulli or something. Um, and all my entries are Gaussian or Bernoulli. Um, I, it has to be centered and, and here's the right normalization condition. I have to put a one over square root n here. Um, but I'm interested right now just in bad Wigner matrices. So you should think that it, uh, maybe it has heavy tails and that means a few things, but for me, it means few moments. Right? So I maybe have only 10 moments or something. And I'm interested in, in sort of the determinant asymptotics for this matrix. Okay, so I'll remind you, Gerard uh, made this observation before, um, but the reason this problem looks like it should be easy is that you can you can make this observation. So if I if I write mu hat hn for the empirical measure, which is the average of delta masses at the eigenvalues, and let me also emphasize, for me, mu hat um, is always an empirical measure, so hats always mean empirical. Then I can write the expected absolute determinant just as e to the n uh, times this function psi evaluated at the empirical measure where psi as a functional on probability measures is just a log potential at zero. Okay, so Gerard mentioned this before, this is just this n kills this n kills this one over n, the determinant of the product of the eigenvalues comes down like this. Um, and once you're here, it really looks like a concentration question. Right? And so it looks uh, like if you know fast enough concentration, well, since for Wigner matrices, the empirical measure tends to semicircle, which is rho sc for us, um, then if you can show that this concentrates at speed a little bit faster than n, then you expect that if I put a one over n log here, um, I should just get psi evaluated at the limit rho sc. So this is so Gerard is uh, giving the suggestion also. Um, and, and I want to explain that this is a, not quite as easy as sort of turning the, turning the crank for uh, concentration results. And so there's two concentration results for Wigner matrices. Um, that I want to mention here is there's a sort of very classical problem. Um, the first one I want to mention is, is a, a result of uh, Bordenov, Caputo, and Chafai in 2011, which studies kind of this exact problem. So concentration uh, for sort of linear statistics um, or test functions evaluated against the empirical measure. And right for us, um, f of lambda uh, is log of the absolute value of lambda. So the result is that for such functions, you have concentration at speed n um, under basically no assumptions on the Wigner matrix, as long as the function test function f has bounded variation. Okay, so this is so the uh, this doesn't quite apply for us. The concentration is not quite fast enough, and also of course the logarithm is a bad function. Um, it's not that bad. Uh, and the second result I want to mention is is one of Elise Guinea and Ofer Zaytuni in 2000. Um, what they showed is that uh, under some more conditions than the Wigner matrix, so if mu satisfies the log Sobolev inequality. Uh, or it has compact support. Um, then you have concentration at speed n squared, right? sort of the same uh, speed of large deviations, which is which is much better than what we need. Um, and again, there's some restrictions, so the test functions have to be one Lipschitz. Okay, so so we want we're interested in Wigner matrices which are kind of bad, 
Uh, so we want few assumptions on, on, on the measure mu. Um, we also need concentration a little bit faster than n, but what, what's our, what the kind of saving grace is, is that we're actually only interested in, in one test function. Right? So we can do kind of log specific things. We don't need um, results of this type, which are on kind of a whole class of test functions. Uh, and by kind of maneuvering things in the right way, uh, we can get this result. So the result for Wigner matrices is that if mu has just two plus epsilon finite moments, then you can get the limit that we claimed. And actually a little bit better, you can even shift the matrix by um, some e times identity for any real value e, and I just get a shift in the log potential here. Okay, so, so I'm gonna talk about uh, this assumption. I'm gonna claim that this guy is actually near optimal. Okay. And the reason um, is that if mu has infinite second moment, uh, then it's, it's been known for some time that the limiting empirical spectral measure exists, but it's not semicircular anymore. So in the physics literature, this goes back to Cizo and Bouchot in 94, and then um, Gerard ben and Elise Guiné worked on this in, in 2008. So you might think, okay, well, I should just take whatever this limiting empirical spectral measure is and just put it here instead of semicircle. But it's actually um, worse or simpler if you want than that. Uh, so actually, if mu is infinite second moment, then the expected absolute value of the determinant is just plus infinity for every end. So, so um, one way to see this kind of quickly, if I expand the determinant as a sum over permutations, um, then if I have a permutation that picks up, you know, like the one, two entry and the two, one entry, then I just get some matrix entry squared and that blows up because I think in a second moment. So it's not quite a proof, there's absolute value we have to worry about, but that's, that's kind of morally what's going on. Um, and for this reason, up to this kind of epsilon, this is a, a near optimal moment condition. Okay. And, and the way you prove this is, um, or the way we prove this is by applying this kind of general theorem, this general concentration result, uh, which says that you get the kind of the, the result that we're interested in under these five theorems or these five assumptions, um, which I'll write out here. So the, the first uh, two are basically say that you recognize your matrix HN as a function of some independent random variables. Okay, so I pick X1 through XN, um, they're independent real random variables and M can depend on N. And then I, um, apply, uh, I apply to them some function phi which maps into real symmetric matrices. And this function should be Lipschitz and pull convex sets back to convex sets. Okay, so it's kind, of, it's kind of a heady academic way of writing it, but for Wigner, um, the way that I write my a Wigner matrix as a function of some independent random variables uh, is just my independent random variables are the upper triangular ones. These are my XIs, right? And phi just copies them below the diagonal. Um, but we'll talk about cases where it's, it's not quite so clear. Um, assumption E says that there, there's some nice measure mu infinity. So for us, for Wigner, right, this is a semicircle. Um, and nice, in about 20 minutes, I'll give you some examples where nice is not so clear. Uh, but there's a nice measure mu infinity that's kind of a, a, just a polynomially good approximation um, for the average empirical measure. And this is, this is pretty mild, so I can explain why later. Um, this assumption C says is, is coarse bounds on very large and small eigenvalues because there's uh, the singularity of the logarithm at zero and infinity. So we have to just say that there's you know, no or few eigenvalues of this type. Um, and assumption S is what we're calling sort of spectral stability. So it's, you don't have to worry about this equation exactly, but it says that when I truncate my XIs, um, it doesn't change the empirical measure that much. Uh, and the reason why truncating XIs and changing the empirical measure is important is the way that you prove this theorem um, is to use Telegram's classic result and concentration for product functions. Right? So what, what Telegram teaches us is that uh, Lipschitz convex functions of many bounded independent random variables concentrate. Right? And that's what we're doing is we're, we're recognizing the log potential as almost a Lipschitz convex function of some bounded independent random variables, which are the truncated XIs. Um, right, and because this is where you need assumptions on phi pulling convex sets back to convex sets, for example. Um, and once you kind of have this, this setup in mind, then you can apply the right results of Telegram and, and things work out. Um, and the benefit of writing it in kind of this abstract way uh, is that we can then just apply this theorem to a wide variety of random matrix models. And I'll talk about that in a moment, um, just by checking all these assumptions. Okay. What I want to explain for a few minutes is that these assumptions are kind of plausible and, and you know, how would you check them if you had a new matrix that you cared about. Um, so the, the, the first two assumptions are, are this one saying that HN is a function um, of some independent random variables. And in the case of Wigner, uh, as I was saying, there's kind of an obvious choice, which is I, I take my XIs to be the matrix entries 
and I take psi to be the uh, sorry phi to be the map that arranges them in the matrix. Um, but as I will I will kind of leave one aside, which is it's not always so easy. Um, for example, it's not clear to me how to recognize the adjacency matrix of a random deregular graph in this way. Right. So the, equivalently, um, recognizing a random deregular graph in this way would be finding an algorithm that generates an exactly uh, uniformly random deregular graph. I mean, so I, I look at all the deregular graphs in n vertices. There's finitely many, so I take uniform measure. Um, and this algorithm should be based on some independent input random variables. And, and it should be kind of a Lipschitz function of these variables and pull convex sets back to convex sets. Right, so it's kind of a, a pure problem in, in random graphs. You know, I, if I give you 100 Bernoullis or something, can you cook up an exactly uniformly random deregular graph? Um, and if you knew how to do this, you could apply this. But that's a sort of a fun problem to think about. And in most cases, it, this is not too hard to check. Um, assumption E, which says that there's kind of some nice measure of infinity, which is you know, a mildly good approximation for the average empirical measure, typically follows from local laws. So if you have a local law uh, that's available to you for the matrix that you're interested in, um, there's kind of a standard machine that you plug in and you'll, you'll get back a result of this type. Um, and I'll say for the sort of more, uh, on the more technical side, um, the local law can be suboptimal. Um, so, so if you want an, an optimal, what people call an optimal local law and that literature would end up with a one over N here, but we don't need that. Um, and so for the, the universality folks, uh, right, we can take the spectral parameter eta to just be a little bit polynomially smaller than order one. Um, and if you have bulk and edge local laws, you can stitch those together if you like. Um, so for us, for, for the case of Wigner, checking this is, is uh, essentially just importing the results of Alexander Tikomirov in 2009. So in some respects, checking these assumptions is about kind of finding the right results. But what I'm trying to argue is that these are um, often available. They're kind of commonly studied types of results. Okay, so assumption C, um, for coarse bounds and very large and small eigenvalues, uh, for the upper bounds, um, there's some kind of elementary arguments in, in the paper that uh, seem fairly robust. They, they can relate large eigenvalues to large entries, and then you can kind of do Markovs and things like this. Um, small eigenvalues are a little bit harder, uh, but there's often results available um, if, on fixed energy universality. If you have that, that's great. Um, or you can study smallest singular value. That's a very common problem if you can find papers like this. Uh, and if you don't have those, you can just do short complements in many cases, and that, that often ends up working out. Um, so for us, for Wigner, we end up using kind of the smallest singular value results of nu n in 2012. Again, that's sort of finding the right paper. Um, and finally, assumption S, the sort of spectral stability, um, it maybe looks a little weird, uh, but for, for Wigner and for every other model we need, we need it for, um, we're adapting arguments of, of Bordenov, Caputo, and Shafai in 2011, and Bordenov and Caputo in 2014. Uh, which are based on Bennett's inequality, which is some uh, inequality in, in high dimensional probability from um, the 60s. Uh, so, so the point is that this is kind of a usable theorem, um, and you can use it to, to apply to other models. Okay, so the first uh, model you're interested in after Wigner, the sort of other most classic random matrix is sample covariance. Right, so in sample covariance, I, I take some matrix Y, um, and it, whose entries are IID, and it's a rectangular matrix, it's, it's P by N, um, and the, the entries are independent copies of some measure mu, which again has only two plus epsilon finite moments um, and a little more density, but the moment condition is, is what's interesting uh, right now. Uh, and the regime that's most classical in random matrices is when P is a function of N and it's actually basically gamma times N for some ratio gamma. Um, and the result that's quite old is that the eigenvalues of the matrix uh, YY transpose are then described by the marchenko pastor law which I'll write as a mu mp gamma. Um, and so the result, just by sort of applying this general theorem, is you know, the same result that we had before, um, except the marchenko pastor law goes here. Um, and again, you can shift by E and R, and then these, these P and N are, are the right things to put here to get a good limit. Um, and again, this, this 2 plus epsilon finite moments is, is almost optimal up to the epsilon um, for the same reason uh, that it's almost optimal for Wigner matrices. So these are kind of the two most classic models. Um, and you can then ask, what about sparse matrices? Right, so so the, the, the first model you would think of as sparse matrices is Erdős-Rényi, um, which is, first of all, a random graph model. Uh, so I take n vertices. There's n choose two possible edges. And I sample each of them independently with probability p. Um, and then the random matrix you look at is the adjacency matrix times the scaling. Um, so that's a real symmetric random matrix whose entries are Bernoulli variables. Right? 
Um, and you can ask what, in different regimes of P. So if P is constant, then HN is essentially a Wigner matrix. It's non-centered, which is kind of a minor issue. Um, but if P tends to zero as a function of N, then the, the adjacency matrix is sparse because it has on average P times N non-zero entries per row. Um, and it's known that this model has a phase transition at P order one over N. So there's some logarithmic factors I'm hiding. Um, but when, when P is, uh, so there's many observables, um, for example, that change, uh, you start to see disconnected vertices when P is smaller than this, for example. Um, but when P is at least one over N, then it's, it's known that the empirical measure tends to semicircle almost shortly. So we're in kind of a semicircular regime. Um, and the result, again, as a corollary, is, is when P is just above this phase transition, so just some kind of little epsilon uh, polynomially above this phase transition, um, we have the sort of same result that I keep showing you, and the semicircle is here because it's a limiting empirical measure, and there's a little restriction on E. Um, so this is sort of one model of sparse matrices. Uh, another model of sparse matrices that um, people like to think about is band matrices. That's kind of the last corollary I'll give here. So uh, to, to define a band matrix, I pick a bandwidth W, which depends on N, um, and some probability measure mu. And then I just put, sim uh, so up to symmetry, I put copies of mu just on this band of width W uh, about the diagonal. And I'll take it to be periodic. Um, and so I have these kind of corner guys. Uh, okay, and this happens to be the right scaling. Um, so people have studied this because there, there's uh, supposed to be a phase transition when W is order square root N. And so this is a very, very well studied problem. Um, so many observables are supposed to change. For example, uh, eigenvectors are supposed to be localized, meaning they have mass on little O of N sites if W is smaller than square root N. And they're supposed to be delocalized if W is much larger than square root N. Um, however, as soon as W goes to infinity, in, in all these cases, above and below this phase transition, the empirical measure tends to semicircle. Right? And so the natural question uh, is that, okay, so for determinant asymptotics, for determinant concentration, determinants, um, do we see this phase transition at W being square root n? Right? On the one hand, uh, maybe, because many observables change. On the other hand, you might not because the empirical measure doesn't doesn't see this phase transition. Okay. And the result is that we don't see this phase transition. Right? So if W is at least polynomial, some polynomial scale, um, then we have the same result uh, with semicircle here because it's the limiting empirical measure. Um, and again, we can shift by E and R, and we can we need a little regularity of mu that's to be sub-exponential. Um, and so I'll emphasize again, so the, the determinant asymptotics don't see the conjectured phase transition. Um, so you can do both sides, in particular because we can go below the phase transition, uh, we can handle matrices which are thought of as being not mean field. So sort of below the phase transition, you're in a non-mean field regime, um, and we can still study determinant asymptotics. Uh, and, and so having given kind of these examples um, that are all kind of corollaries of this, this theorem using results of Talakon, uh, we can now ask about log Sobolev. So part three is log Sobolev. Um, the question is that this, this general theorem I said before um, looked kind of long, and it's, it's designed for having minimal assumptions at the end of the day. Right? So for bigger matrices with two plus epsilon moments. But if you say before, uh, oh, I have a matrix that's actually much better, um, and I already know that linear statistics concentrate very quickly. So for example, my matrix entries satisfy log Sobolev, um, or I'm working on a compact group and I have gromov milman uh, then in, in general, there should be a different result, there should be an easier result. Uh, and so we can do that. So we have another general theorem um, with a slightly different and an easier proof uh, in here in this regime. So the, the definition of log civil is here. Um, what matters really right now is just that Gaussian, uh, Gaussian matrices satisfy log civil um, And so using this kind of second general theorem, uh, we can we can treat uh, a model in free probability, which is kind of a whole other world from what we've been doing so far, um, a model called the free addition model, which I'll define, uh, and then Gaussian matrices with a variance profile um, or even some correlations, but not today. And, and this Gaussian matrix is a variance profile. Um, this is the one that's most relevant for complexity, so for the elastic manifold model that Gerard was discussing. And so I'll spend sort of more time on this. Um, but to go to free probability first, in, in free probability, one of the uh, most classic matrix models uh, is this matrix here. So I take some deterministic matrices AN and BN. Um, and I conjugate BN by a random orthogonal matrix ON. So ON is Haar uniform, uh, drawn from Haar measure on the orthogonal 
from a group. Um, essentially what's happening, right, since, these, since AN and BN are diagonal matrices, I'm kind of shifting one of them into a random basis. Um, and this has been studied for a while, and it's known that the limiting empirical spectral measure of HN is the free convolution of the limiting empirical measure of AN and the limiting empirical measure of BN. So then you can guess what the result should look like. Um, it's going to be the same determinant concentration, except I have the free convolution here. Right? Uh, so there's some technical assumptions on the, the, matri the, uh, the matrices that I won't go into, and a little bit something on the edge. Um, but this is kind of the gromov milman regime. Uh, and then it, again, for complexity, the thing that matters most is Gaussian with the variant profile. Okay, so this has some notation. Um, so I'm just interested right now in the case of independent entries up to symmetry. I don't want to do anything more complicated. Um, but my, my entries are all Gaussian, uh, but now I have a mean M and they all have a variant sigma. So the most classic model, which I'm gonna keep comparing things to, um, is if the means are all zero and the variances are all one over N, you get the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble or the GOE. Um, and in that case, the, you know, the pictures people have seen where the, the eigenvalues all look semicircular. Um, but it's not gonna be the case anymore if you change these. And so I'll show you some pictures in a moment. Um, but the idea is that we're gonna get uh, and Gerard was, was alluding to this, we're gonna get kind of a different looking result from what we had before. So we're now saying it's like we had before, except there's now measures mu n instead of mu infinity. Uh, and right, so we're saying, we're not saying that this converges to something anymore, we're saying it's, it's close to something. Um, and and it's, it's close to this kind of sequence under the assumption that uh, these, these sort of mean field assumptions. Okay, so so H N should be flat. Um, flatness you should think of as kind of a mean field condition on the variances. That's defined here. It says that um, the the operator defined by sort of conjugating by H N minus its mean um, is essentially the same as the operator just taking the trace up to some constant c. Um, and then you also need some condition on the mean. You should you should say that the mean doesn't move things around too much. Um, and the measures mu n come from what's called the matrix Dyson equation, um, developed by Lazo Erdős and his collaborators in the last few years. Uh, and I can spend some time sort of talking about what is the matrix Dyson equation, um, and how does it come up, and, and how does it help us define things here. And mostly the question of um, when can you put a mu infinity here, uh, and why can't you always do it? Okay. Um, so here's sort of some pictures to show that you, you don't always get semicircle anymore. Uh, so if I, if I take my matrix of variances um, to have this special form, just to cook something up, so I have uh, J is the, the matrix of all ones, uh, and I take you know, various A's and B's and C's, and I, I even add a little bit of a mean, um, you can get pictures that are very different from semicircle. So with, with these parameters, which don't matter, um, you can get curves with these kind of weird spikes. You can get something asymmetric. Uh, you can get things that have um, disconnected components of the support. Okay. Uh, and the idea is, is that we want to give some kind of analytic description of these curves. Right. So we, we have an analytic description of semicircle, there's an explicit form. Um, we want to say that, you know, get, get kind of a formula for this curve here. And the matrix Dyson equation is, is a tool that lets us do this. So it's an equation whose unique solution uh, is used to analytically describe these curves. Right. And kind of the standard way this happens um, in random matrices is uh, if I want to find, if I want to analytically describe some curves like this, um, what, what people have tried to find for a while is some self-consistent equation, some implicit equation, satisfied by the Steeltris transform of mu n. Okay, so let me just to, to remind the definition. So the Steeltris uh, steel transform um, is the integral mu n uh, d lambda over lambda minus z for z um, in the upper half plane. And you can sort of recover the, matrix, the measure mu n from its steel just transform. Um, so the, the easiest, kind of the most classic example uh, is GOE. Um, so, so you can, the steel just transform is explicit of semicircle, um, MSC if it's still just transform. Um, but you can also think of it as being the solution to this quadratic equation. So MSC uh, is one over minus Z minus MSC of Z for Z in the upper half plane. Um, and if you wanted to, you could describe the semicircle as being the measure whose field plus transform is the unique solution of this equation. Okay, so that's kind of the most classic one. Um, another thing that people have done with this is if I add a mean to my matrix to the GOE matrix, some deterministic mean, 
And what, what we learned from Pastor Andrei Kolescu is that the good uh, measure mu n, the good density to describe this, is the free convolution of semicircle and the uh, empirical measure of dn. And you can describe this measure by its this transform mn, which satisfies what's called the Pastor relation, which is this equation here. Okay, so it looks like what I had above. It's now the integral with respect to um, the empirical measure. Uh, and of course, when dn is zero, I mean, if you're claiming these are all generalizations, so when dn is zero, um, then mu hat of zero is just a delta mass of zero, right? So this lambda goes away, and I get this equation up here. So it is a generalization. Um, and the MD is kind of a, a, for, a further generalization of this, if you want. Um, that's good to describe Gaussian matrices to the variance profile. So I'll actually give you a, a simpler version called the vector Dyson equation first. Um, so the vector Dyson equation is, is what you should use for centered matrices with the variance profile. And the matrix Dyson equation is what you use for non-centered matrices. Um, so I, these are actually useful for significantly more complicated problems. So for, for matrices with correlations or non-Gaussian matrices, but I'm just gonna give kind of the, the, the simplest versions today. Um, and, and there's, a, there's an extremely nice regularity theory that we're really benefiting from. So you can, you can make claims like uh, measures described by the matrix Dyson equation have Holderian densities, for example. Uh, this regularity theory was developed, um, sorry, in a sequence of papers in the last five or 10 years by uh, sort of the team at IST Austria. So various combinations of Oskaria Yanke, Johannes Alp, Lazo Erdisch, Torben Kruger, Irina Misch, and Dominic Kruger. Um, and actually their interest was quite different. So they were interested in studying universality of local eigenvalue statistics um, and establishing what's called the Wigner Dyson Meta Conjectures. What this says is that if I take um, some Gaussian matrix of the variance profile, uh, and, and I zoom in to the eigenvalues, uh, you know, the small number of eigenvalues, and if locally they behave just like GOE. But the conductor says that really all that matters um, is the symmetry class. If it's real symmetric, I get one behavior. If it's complex permission, I get another behavior. Um, and they were interested in using this, this MDE to, to prove these kinds of results for increasingly general matrices. Um, but we're interested in kind of a different problem, which is just sort of the, the maybe the easier problem of right, describing these curves in some analytic way. And so we're interested in just kind of the global behavior of eigenvalues. Um, and so here are the equations. So, so the vector Dyson equation is what you use for centered matrices. So for centered matrices, you solve a deterministic constrained problem over vectors, uh, which is de de defined in terms of the variance matrix S whose entries are the, the, the ijth entry of S uh, is the variance of the ijth entry of H. Um, and what I do is I search for M, which is a, a vector of length N, complex numbers, uh, which, is, who's, uh, which is the unique solution to this um, set of N coupled equations, the N coupled scalar equations, which look like the ones I had before, except I have this S here. So if I solve these N coupled equations, I get this vector. Uh, and I average the components, and that gives me the Steeldus transform at Z. Right. So I'm, I'm looking for a Steeldus transform at some point Z in the upper half plane. I solve this problem. Um, I normalize, or I take the average of components of my vector, and that gives me the solution. Um, for a non-centered matrix, I'm sorry, for a non-centered Gaussian matrix, um, what you solve is the matrix Dyson equation, which is a constrained problem over matrices instead of vectors. Okay, so it's, it's, it says this equation. So it says I'm looking for um, MN, which is an N by N ma uh, matrix of complex numbers, which is the unique solution to this problem. So MN should be the mean AN. So I'm splitting up my matrix as AN plus WN, where AN is the, the mean of HN and WN is kind of the center. Um, so MN of Z should be AN minus Z minus this kind of conjugation operator applied to MN, taking the inverse. So again, this is kind of a generalization of the GOE problem, um, because if I had GOE here, the solution is just the steel just transform of semicircle times identity. And once I have this, the solution to this equation, I take the normalized trace, and that's the steel just transform at Z of my measure mu n. Okay, so it's, it's a way of describing measures, um, describing these kinds of curves we're interested in. And, and what I want to talk about now is, is why did I have mu n before? So let me go back here. Um, so I had mu n, and the question is, why not mu infinity? Okay. Um, and what's happening here is that, so mn is determined, 
even if you don't understand that what's happening exactly in this equation, determined uh, based on level n information, right? Uh, so, the, the, so only information about the kind of the, the variant structure of the matrix at level n uh, appears in this equation, and so it's just what determines mu n. And so if there's no connection between hn and hn plus 1, if you want kind of as general a theorem as possible, um, there's no a priori connection between mu n and mu n plus 1, and so there's no a priori limit mu n tending to mu infinity. Um, but of course, in the cases we're interested in, in something like the elastic manifold, there is a connection between the matrices, and so there is a limit mu infinity. Um, but kind of the most general theorem you could, you could ask about uh, just looks like this, and it just has measures mu n. Um, so that's kind of the end of the, the random matrix part of the talk. And I want to talk at the end about um, spin glasses and things you can understand about spin glasses uh, with, with these tools here. Okay, so I'll talk about a particular model um, called bipartite spin glasses. And so Gerard talked about uh, what's kind of the most classical spherical spin glass, the single species pure P spin. So it's a function I'll write at HNP um, going from the unit sphere into R. And so he wrote it like this. He said that HNP um, defined at some function sigma is sum from I1 to IP, J I1, J IP um, times sigma I1, sigma IP. Um, you could equivalently say that it's just the centered Gaussian field on the sphere with covariance given by this, which is the inner product. So the covariance of Hn uh, of sigma, Hn of sigma prime, is the inner product to the power p. Okay, so that's one description. Um, the bipartite spin glass uh, is sort of a generalization. So I take my spins and I put them in kind of two groups. So I take, uh, and essentially I pick a gamma in zero, one, and integers p and q. And I look at the spin glass, which is defined on the product of two spheres. Okay, so the first spheres are my kind of my first gamma n coordinates. The second sphere is my kind of last one minus gamma n coordinates. And I take the, uh, the centered Gaussian process on this product of spheres, whose covariance essentially takes the first terms and puts the inner product to the power p, and the second terms puts the inner product to the power q. Okay, so it's um, also I'm, I'm hiding in here, there's, there's factors of n which don't matter for us right now. Um, and so you should think that I'm kind of putting the spins in two groups or two species, and I'm putting a p spin on the first layer because this looks like this, and a q spin on the second layer. Okay, so at first, this looks like kind of um, an academic uh, generalization of, of the classical spin glass. Um, but there's two reasons that it's, it's interesting. And the first one is that it's a little bit less mean field than the single species case. Right, so if you say that I like spin glasses and eventually I'm interested in Edwards Anderson or something where um, the spin glasses have very kind of local interactions, uh, then you can say, well, I'm, I'm going to start with sort of the classical spherical spin glass where everybody interacts with everybody else. Um, and move kind of one step away and sort of start to, to make the spins a little bit different from each other and interact with kind of fewer people. Um, and that's kind of one motivation. The other motivation classically for this is that um, while it looks like it's kind of just a minor tweak of, of the single species case, um, a lot of the classical arguments break down. And so for example, there's still no Parisi formula for bipartite charge and Kirkpatrick. And so one of the, the motivations historically has been um, well, since kind of the classical arguments break, if you have new arguments, you can kind of use bipartite models as a testing ground um, and think, well, if I can understand something in the bipartite case, maybe I have kind of a robust argument with spin glasses. Um, and so this is what people have done historically. So it goes back at least to, to Fyodor, Kornblit, and Schender in the 80s. Um, Barra, Genovese, and Guerra were studying this in 2011. And there's been kind of a nice interplay back and forth between math and physics. So uh, Alfinger Chen is a math paper. Um, Vara et al. two different years is, is a physics paper. Panchenko did a math paper. Um, Hartnett, Parker, and Geist on the physics side. And then and recently, uh, Jin Ho Baik and Ji Yun Lee on, and on the math side and Jean-Christophe Moura um, have all kind of been interested in this problem of, of can I develop sort of new arguments using bipartite as a test case? Um, and for us right now, actually the most relevant paper is uh, Alfinger and Chen. Um, we gave upper and lower bounds for complexity on, of this model based on coupling two single species spin glasses. Um, and that was enough to show something like the model was exponentially complex, for example. Um, and I'm, I'm going to give you a, sort of an exact formula 
Um, and, and the question I want to talk about for a moment is I'm going to give you a variational formula, and why should the formula be variational? So, so Girard is giving variational formulas as well. Um, and it's obviously due to some sort of a false method. Um, but in order to, to just make sure we're clear on uh, why the formula makes sense. Um, so for, uh, the, the, the matrices are a little bit more complicated than what I've said before. Um, for something like single species spin glass, the cat's rice random matrix is not actually GOE. Um, it's basically distributed as GOE plus psi times identity, where psi is some normal variable that's independent of the GOE. Okay, so in particular, um, this HN has correlations Um, along the diagonal, right, via via this term psi, um, something like the, the, the 1, 1 entry is correlated with the NN entry, if you want. Um, and so we'll call this long-range correlation. It's a matrix of long-range correlations um, with one degree of freedom because psi is a scalar. You could imagine I could put in, you know, five degrees of freedom, 10 degrees of freedom, something like this. Um, and the problem is that because of this, this matrix HN is not actually um, in the kind that we can study. But the, the sort of classic uh, solution, this is we're not the first people to use this trick, is because these are independent, it's a product measure, I can just integrate over the GOE first, and these sort of low degree correlations last. Right, so what I, can, I can write this out exactly um, as an integral uh, where the, I put it here, expectation with respect to the GOE of GOE plus just U times identity, some deterministic shift now, but then U is actually Gaussian, it corresponds um, to the psi up here. Right, so I haven't really done anything, I've just written this as an integral over R, but now we can understand these matrices, and what we uh, our determinant results show is that this is basically um, like E to the N times this log potential, but mu infinity now depends on U, because there's a U here. Um, and then because I have the n there and this n here, uh, then using the Laplace method, you just get a variational formula. Right, so this is kind of under the hood for what Gerard was saying. Um, you get these kind of one-dimensional variational formulas if there's one degree of freedom in your correlations. If you have 10 degrees, you have a 10-dimensional variational formula. Um, and the variational formulas always look like sort of log potential of my whatever my limiting empirical measure is, and it now depends on you. And there's the Gaussian correction u squared. That's kind of what's happening under the hood in all of these problems. Um, and for bipartite spin glasses, uh, these sort of two things we've been talking about both appear. So the, the, the cat's rice random matrix, meaning the condition Hessian, um, is Gaussian with a mean and a variance profile. Okay, so it's the, the sort of in the class I was mentioning. Um, and it, the, the variance profile comes in two blocks corresponding to the two species. That's why you have different variances. And it has these one dimensional long range correlations that we just discussed. So now I'm interested in these, because I have a Gaussian matrix with a mean and a variance profile, I care about the matrix size and equation. So I get measures from the matrix size and equation. Um, and here you can actually simplify and say that describe your stateless transforms by solving kind of two quadratic equations in two unknowns. So it's, it's somewhat simpler than a matrix problem here. And once you have these measures, um, you can get this kind of result. So this is sort of on the uh, a result on the physics side, um, saying that the expected number of critical points behaves exponentially like this one-dimensional variational problem, right? where S of u is what I had before, so it's, it's the log potential of my measures mu infinity u minus this Gaussian correction. And there's also this term v, which is a volume term from Katz twice. So it's, it's explicit, here it is. Um, so this is sort of the formula for total critical points. Uh, and there's analogs for critical points, as I was mentioning, below level t, um, counting just local minima, and also counting mixtures. Um, I've been telling you mostly the pure story. For mixtures, it's somewhat more complicated. This is a variational problem um, in three dimensions, or well, one dimension, so it's somewhat more involved. Um, and, and while this is a variational formula, you can massage it a little bit um, to get two sort of qualitative consequences for pure models. Uh, and so the first consequence is that if gamma is p over p plus q, right, so this is my special ratio, remember that hn p uh, q gamma is a function from the unit sphere gamma n um, times unit sphere 1 minus gamma uh, n. Okay. If I have a special value of gamma, then actually the measures of mu infinity are semicircular, um, and so everything is solvable. What you find is that the complexity is actually the same as a pure single species p plus q spin, which is sort of surprising. 
Um, what we're essentially saying here is that bipartite bipartite p q gamma uh, is p over p plus q from the perspective of complexity is essentially the same as a single species p plus q um, at least at the from the perspective of complexity and it's kind of unclear uh, how much should be true from from other perspectives um, and the last consequence you can get uh, is that all the local minima lie at low energies meaning if I'm a local minimum, I have small Hamiltonian value. Uh, so what this means in notation is that there's there's some threshold E infinity, which is positive, um, such that it's exponentially unlikely at speed a little bit faster than N to find any local minimum with energy above the level uh, minus E infinity times N, which is the right scaling, and then with some sort of epsilon tolerance. Right, so because E infinity is positive, minus E infinity is actually a negative threshold, so it says that I have low energies. Um, and this kind of phenomenon is actually, it was already known for single species spin glasses. So, so the, the story uh, from Alfinger, Benner, and Cherney was that for single species spin glasses, um, there's kind of bands of, of critical points with low index at low energy levels. And we can kind of partially confirm that picture here, um, at least for minima, uh, the catch, I guess, is that E infinity is, is not explicit anymore. Um, but there, there, it's, it sort of remains to be seen uh, how much the, the story for critical points of fixed index still holds here. Um, and I will end my talk here and thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you very much, Ben, for this uh, informative talk. Are there questions or comments for Ben? You can either unmute yourself or write questions to the chat. I, I have a question which is maybe a naive question. You take now yeah. two groups and the bipartite mm -hmm. model, but could this be generalized to more groups or would this be get uh, very complicated? Yeah, so you can definitely, uh, you can do k-partite for k-fixed for sure. Yeah. Um, in that case, you would get probably a uh, k minus one dimensional variational problem here. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that part would be fine. Uh, if k tends to infinity as a function of n, that's a little more complicated. Um, it's sort of similar, it's, it's, it's kind of a similar um, constraint to what Jared was saying about other, other scaling regimes of the elastic manifold. It's kind of a similar random matrix problem, and so if you can solve one, you can probably solve both. Um, but you, you kind of move away from mean field if you have a, a, a growing number of groups with the dimension. So uh, partially, I guess it's a partial answer. Yeah, I see. Are there further questions or comments? Ah, oh, there's also a question. Ask no, um... One question. Yeah. Yes? Can I also ask one question? Basically, you are mentioning uh, generalizations to non Gaussian entries and non Gaussian matrices. You basically talked about um, GOE. Uh, is, uh, to what extent is this generalizable to other types of non Gaussian and other random matrices? Thanks. Uh, so, so which, which model are you interested in exactly? Um, so, for example, here we go. Blah, 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 blah. Um, so, wait, basically, so, so, the full scheme, but yes. So, so the, the Wigner result is, is non-Gaussian. Okay. Uh, there we go. Sorry. Go back here. Um, okay, the Wigner result is non-Gaussian, right? Um, this is for any any distribution that has two plus epsilon finite moments. Um, if you're interested in the, the case of the variance profile, is that what your question is? Yes, that's right. Yes, sure. Uh, okay. So, so, so with a variance profile, um, I can give you a part. So, okay, again, sort of partial. So, uh, if your law is very nice, um, the answer is probably yes. And the, the issue, I can say, essentially, um, the issue is is assumption E. Right. So, can you can you check this? Uh, and it's basically an issue of do you have the right local law? Okay. So, if if uh, I'm interested in a matrix of the variance profile and the law of all the entries. Um, 
satisfies log Sobolev or something, then you're probably fine. Uh, there should be a good local law. Um, if you're interested in a variance profile, if your matrices just, if your entries just have, you know, four moments, um, I don't know of a good enough local law uh, when, when I have a variance profile like this. Um, if you could find a good local law, then, then probably. Um, but if, if you're interested in something like Bernoulli with a profile, that's probably fine. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Does that answer your question? It could be extended, but thanks. Thanks. Are there further questions? This doesn't seem to be the case, so I suggest that we unmute ourselves and give an applause to Ben. Thank you very much, Mia and Julia. Thanks for the nice talk. Thank you. I, yeah. Hmm. I heard recently um, Torben Krüger on this topic, but uh, but this was a bit too fast for me, <laughs> I have to say. But uh, you Which defined the objects. That was already very nice. Yeah, it's good to see. It's good to just see the equation and see what's kind of happening. Um, yeah, yeah, and it's good to, if you have a general audience, it's good to somehow define really the objects and not to give some three letter abbreviations. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Thank you very much. Take care. Okay, bye. Bye.